Welcome back to another episode. Today we are talking about a nomad property in Westminster, Colorado. We'll run through all the numbers on there, how we bought it, um, what the numbers look like when the uh, investor moves out, and how it fits in the longer term plan. My guest co host today is Preston Newberry. Preston. Hey, Chris, how's, how's it going? It? Very good, man. So, this is another uh, deal that uh, you know we did together, one junior, so we can talk about all the numbers. So, this is, I could call it just a solid base hit property. I mean, a lot of the properties buy are just great base hits, especially when it comes to that. Especially when it comes to nomads and house hacks. You yep. can't get too creative on those types of properties. No, you can't. I mean, obviously, you know, every once in a while we'll come across something that's just ex exciting and, uh, you know, above average. But at the end of the day, you know, it's all about just acquiring and finding those base hits. And uh, pretty soon you'll have your Monopoly board filled up. Exactly. I mean, and, and that's, the, that, that's the best analogy there is. Uh, so our client on here, he is a new investor, um, a very detailed data-oriented guy. So he studied lots of investing strategies and just said, hey, this Nomad model, he goes, it just makes the most sense. Like, I go, yes. It does. Absolutely. And, and that was the fun thing about working with this client is he always had a lot of really good questions and yeah. definitely gave us a run for our money sometimes, but it was uh, it was good. Yeah, but and he also geeked out numbers with us, yep. which is which is always enjoyable for us as well. Totally. So, I mean, he studied all the nomading stuff, all the house hacking stuff, all the detailed financial modeling. He said, hey, this is where I want to go. You know, he's a, a, I say a younger, newer investor, but he said, hey, I've got a good job. I got some money saved up. I can do this a few times and it'll help me retire early down the road. And so he wanted to get a place that was, uh, you know, close to his job. And also had a good, you know, price to rent ratio, and that's why a lot of times we're buying places in Westminster, Thornton, Arvada, Lakewood, yep, those areas. Just good pockets of older homes up there that are, you know, coming on the market as things happen, and uh, you know, you can still find find decent prices and stuff under four hundred thousand. That makes sense. And for this, no surprise, we found this one on the MLS, which we is did. where we find so far we found every house hack and nomad on the MLS. Every single one. Of yeah, them. and that's just nature of the beast, and you know, that's because. We can't close in seven days. We're not looking for the major rehabs, but if we found the MLS, great property. So it's a detached single-family home, five-bedroom, two-bathroom up in Westminster. And uh, let's see, Preston. It was listed at three sixty-five, and we had it in our contract for three seventy-five and change. Yep. So this was definitely another one of those competitive situations, but we, uh, you know, ran through the numbers, did all of our our homework. You know, before we went in and made sure that the client was comfortable with this, I ran up a ton of comps, and you know, I felt that they had definitely underpriced the property a little bit. So we we were confident, um, especially after talking with the lender, of you know being over the the list price, which you know, oftentimes in our market, we'll see sellers want to price their property just a little bit under where they think market value is to drive that competition. So um, you know, we were prepared for that going in. Do you recall how many other offers there were? There were six other offers, if I remember correctly, on this. So one. how did uh, I mean how we beat them out? It just comes down to, you know, obviously presenting a really good package, um, working with, you know, solid lenders that, you know, will reach out and talk to listing agents, pick up the phone, um, create that relationship, and, uh, you know, just make sure that you let the other agent know and let the seller know that you're you're going to get this deal to the closing table. That's that's what counts at the end of the day, is having that confidence to, to let the, the other agent know that you're going to make this deal happen no matter what. And then plus, I mean, you know, we, we have the track record. We show people. I think he worked with Joe on this loan as well. Yep. And so we just present the team, present the track record, present the client that, hey, they've got their stuff together. We're going to get it there unless there's a major obstacle. We always have our outs there for inspection stuff. Yep. But uh, for us, we just present the package. And the big thing for us, too, is it's, it's got to be a win-win for everybody. I mean, you know, our clients, but also the sellers, we know everybody just wants to get to the closing table. So it's all about finding compromises as things come up and making sure that we uh, we handle those as, as best we can and uh, keep on moving down the road. So when we, you know, we got in our contract, uh, we got our inspector in there within the first few days, like yep. we always do, because we, we move fast on that. We knocked that out quick. What was the inspection report like? Um, so it actually wasn't bad. This was an older home. Um, the garage had been converted into living space at some point um, quite a while ago. Uh, so there were definitely some, you know, minor electrical things and a few things here and there that needed to be sorted out. The electrical panel did need to be replaced. Um, and there were some concerns with the roof. It just needed some spot repairs. Uh, but, you know, again, nothing really out of the ordinary that we didn't expect. So uh, we were able to negotiate. They got the sewer line cleaned. So this was an interesting one. Um, the seller uh, was actually at the house whenever they did the sewer scope, and uh, we weren't going to object to anything. It was, you know, pr just a pretty simple, you know, just needs to go in and jet it and clean and all that kind of stuff. We were just sticking to, you know, major items that we knew uh, were going to be a big concern. Um, and after the seller saw the uh, the sewer scope video, he actually had somebody come in and clean the sewer line. Oh, and that's we didn't right. Didn't even ask him for it. Yeah. Um, so 
this was another one of those relationship type things where our uh, our buyer client was at the house, the seller was there during the inspection, they actually got to talk and meet and build a little bit of rapport. And so whenever the seller saw this come up, he was like, you know what, this is a nice guy, this is a nice client, you know, I'm going to make sure and take care of this stuff. Um, and funny enough, um, he also saw uh, on the inspection report that the radon came back high. Um, and we didn't ask for, for a radon system. I mean, that's something, hey, we can go in and deal with that later. The seller went in and had a radon system installed, and we didn't even ask for it. So this was a, a pretty cool transaction to be a part of. Yeah. And, I mean, radon systems should be, what, 1000 bucks. 1000 bucks. Yeah. 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 And then, then got a $5,000 credit for the electrical panel and repairing the roof. Yep. And so our client uh, did a 5% down conventional loan. He did work with Joe Massey down at Castle and Cook. The appraisal, another good news, it came, came in, in above. Above value, yeah. just like uh, we kind of thought. So that's you know one of those things, whenever we offer on a property, we always want to go in and check and make sure the value's there. We don't want to overpay for something, uh, but if we can also find a deal, we're going to make sure and do that. And this is something I want to just pause for a second here because you know it was listed at 365 We went under contract at 375 Yep. And this way you can't just look, oh my gosh, you want to over list price. Well, that, that doesn't mean anything. That's just a number the seller's picked. And this one, hey, they did a good job. They priced it well. If you want to price it well, you price it a little bit below fair market value. Yep. And that's how you get activity and we, offers. We call it pricing it under the bridge. And that way, you know, you drive offers and activity. But at the end of the day, um, that's the job of your buyer's agent is to make sure, one, that you don't overpay for a property. Because the last thing we want to do is to have to go back and renegotiate an appraisal that came in low. Because that never never makes anybody happy. So um, doing your homework and making sure that, uh, that the value is there and you're not going to have any issues on the appraisal side of things. So great news that came in. Just, you know. Investor gets to walk with a few extra, uh, some ec extra equity dollars there. So that $5,000 inspection uh, negotiation shows up as a $5,000 seller concession. That way our client could take care of the panel and the roof. And since this is a uh, below 20% down payment loan, PMI is required. He opted to prepay it. When we earned a contract, we sent Joe the contract. Joe ran his numbers. The client... And Joe got together, ran through the options, and it made the most sense for him to prepay the PMI and also buy the interest rate down. So plugging into the rental analysis here, this is just a couple of screenshots of Joe's spreadsheet. Now, if you guys want to see the details, uh, just click on the show notes and these screenshots from the blog post as well. We put in there, we select as a primary residence in the spreadsheet. We put 5% down. Uh, and actually, I'm noticing an error in the spreadsheet. We said monthly paid versus prepaid, so that'll adjust the numbers slightly, but not be a big deal breaker. Purchase price of $375, acquisition about $5,000, seller credits of $5,000, and initial repair cost of $2,000. So the mortgage interest rate he got was 3.625%. And once he moves out, we were estimating a rent of about $2,300 a month for a traditional long term rental. This is, you know, he's nomading. Once he moves out in that you know year to year and a half time frame to nomad to nomad number two, uh, he's gonna probably most likely rent it to a long term tenant. But as we were talking, it's like, hey, may rent in that room by room, or he may get a couple roommates while he lives there as well. Yeah, he was kind of on the fence, but we know no matter what that if he decides or needs to rent the place out to one long term tenant, the numbers are gonna work, and that's what's important. We always want to be as conservative as possible. And so twenty three hundred for long term rent. If you're into that room by room, you know he'll get up there seven to eight hundred dollars per month, or I'm sorry, per room per month, and that'll bring in the gross rents to over three thousand dollars a month. And that will, that's you guys can do that's the math. A big jump, yeah. It's a lot of numbers or a lot, of, a lot of extra rent right there. So going back to our analysis for the long term rental rate, we are assuming a ten percent property management. Again, our preferred PM charge is seven percent. We round up to cover some extra fees. It's a detached home, so you want to write at 8% repairs and maintenance. No HOA, taxes are just under $2,100 a month. Property insurance is just under $1,800 a year. So all the utilities and landscaping, that will be tenant paid or tenants responsible for it. And this is the long-term rate. Now, if we did the room-by-room -room rental, obviously he's getting higher rents. He'll be paying for the utilities, uh, but we underwrote this as a long-term rental. So now looking at the cash flow tab on Joe's spreadsheet, uh, it shows a native cash flow of about $3,700 a year. So, hmm, you know, we don't like to see native cash flow numbers, but as we talk about all the time. It's not always the cash flow, Chris. Yes, what is it? It's everything else that goes into the return on investment, right? And we love to, to look at our ROIQ quadrant. So um, just taking into account, obviously, appreciation, debt pay down, 
cash flow, and depreciation. And that's when the numbers really start to look good. And if you look at those, even with that negative percent cash flow, he's still getting a 77% return on his money because he put so little down. And that's in year down. one. Yes. Yeah. And actually, he put so little down at 5%. Yep. I mean, uh, and the other nice thing is, you know, he... I can't remember if he was going to self-manage or do or hire a property manager, but we was underwrite conservatively. So if he self-manages, it drops the negative cash flow about nine hundred dollars a year. And from our like, you know, just realistic looking at things, if a property is negative a thousand dollars a year or positive thousand dollars a year, it's break even. It's break even. It doesn't really move the needle that much. Yeah. The other thing too, like Chris mentioned, we have the. Uh, mortgage insurance in here as monthly, uh, but he prepaid it. So that's another $1,500 a year that he's going to add to his cash flow. So that should, you know, it actually, you know, if he do, does doing property management, his negative cash flow will be like $2,000 a year. But if he self manages, he'll actually be positive cash flow now because I put the wrong, I selected the wrong thing on the spreadsheet. It's amazing. I review this thing like three times. I always notice the errors. When we're, when we're right recording when we it. go to record, right? <laughs> yeah, that's how it always plays out. Um, but regardless of whether it's a cash flow positive property when he moves out, depending on property manage or self manage, it's gonna be right around that break even mark. Or it could cash flow a few thousand dollars a year. Or if he does rent by uh, room by room rental, he'll be two or three thousand dollars easy positive cash flow a year. But the main thing is, it's just that solid base that we talked about. It makes sense in the long run. He understands his finances. He's he's leveraged up, but he's also keeping a healthy reserves in his operating account. That's always one of the big important factors yeah. that we stress with our clients is keep those healthy reserves. That way you can weather any of the storms that come through or you know global pandemics. Exactly. And so this is just a solid uh, base hit. And so, I mean, look at my notes here, Preston. That's all stuff I wanted to mention. What's on your notes? I think that's all I've got, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Of course. And so guys, if you need help uh, buying a house hack or buying a Nomad, we are always doing these transactions. We always have Pretty much, we always have a couple on our contract at the same time. This is what we're doing. We know the game. We know how to negotiate the properties. We know how to work with lending to manipulate the financing to make numbers work for you. Like, this is our wheelhouse. Reach out to us. We're happy to sit down, talk with you, model out the long-term plan, show you the properties out there, and help you figure out, hey, how does this make sense for what you're doing on, you know, your goal from 20 years from now to bring it back to funding properties and how do you actually manage it, run it, buy it, all that stuff. So, Preston... Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And listeners out there, thank you very much.